you've already seen some of the things that Paul said in Philippians, but he's going to say some stuff um, over and over. And, and, and of course, the one thing that he basically says over and over is, I don't want your joy to be stolen from you. I don't want the joy of your salvation to leak out of you and you just live a sad sack life. So here's what you need to do with your joy. And those are the things that he's going to say over and over. And he even uh, apologizes in the, in the verse up here today. He said, I know, I, I know I've said it. I know you're tired of hearing it. I know, you know. But look, guys, don't let it happen to you. Don't let that become a part of your life because most of us, when we were saved, and really most of us in here in this room right now know the Lord. You've come to the Lord. It might have been years ago, but you belong to Jesus, and you, you love the Lord, and you remember what it was like when you first trusted him. You remember the, how the burden was lifted off of you. You know how... Uh, the birds sang sweeter, the sun shine, <laughs> shone brighter, uh, the birds sounded better. Uh, it was just a wonderful time, and, and you felt free, and you felt uh, exhilarated by the fact that you now belong to the Lord, and that you're going to heaven when you die, and that Jesus lives in your heart, and the Holy Spirit powers your life. But then slowly, over a period of time, some probably quicker than others, your joy began to leak out, it seemed, yes, it seems. Yeah, yeah. And for some of you, it might have been a seep, you know. But now you look around years later and you say, man, what happened to my joy? I used to be excited to be a Christian. It was a joy in my heart. And where did it go? And can I ever get it back? You know, that's a big question. Well, to that kind of thought, Paul wrote the third chapter of Philippians, to that type of thought. And he starts it out. Let me just start it with uh, reading these verses to you. Finally, my brethren. <laughs> I love that, finally. I've already told you the two more chapters, right? <laughs> All right, here's Paul, finally, and then he writes two more chapters, which proves Paul was, was a preacher, right? Mm -hmm. you know, if he say finally, and then he go on about 20 more minutes, yeah. So here, here's a proof that Paul is a preacher right here. If you, didn't, if you didn't need any more, there it is. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, hey, I don't want you to forget about rejoicing now because that's, that's what we're talking about because it's going to be a hard life and there are going to be a lot of killjoys in life and there are going to be a lot of things that rob your joy. So what I want to say to you right now is once again, uh, don't forget about your joy. Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things here, see, this is a little apology. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but it's for, for you it's, uh, it's safe. In other words, I, I don't get tired of saying this to you. I don't get tired of writing this to you. I say it over and over because that's what you need. Yeah, yeah. Because, buddy, you out there where the wolves are, you out there where the, where the scavengers are, where the wild dogs and the yeah. circumcision and everything else is running around out there, and you need all the joy of the Lord you can yeah. get. Man, I'm serious. There we go. Uh, beware of dogs. Ooh, I, what does that mean? We'll get it in a minute. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Doesn't even call them the circumcision. And I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no, no, everybody say no. no. Everybody look at your neighbor and go zero. zero. What does no mean? <laughs> zero. And have no confidence in the flesh. Uh huh. I don't trust your ability to stay right. I don't trust your ability to stay away from sin. I don't trust your ability to follow all these rules and rituals and regulations. We don't have any confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. The Apostle Paul is about to give us now like an autobiography of his life. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you, I am a super legalist. There is nobody more legalistic than I am. And I'm going to show you. 
uh, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of, he, of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law. Man, I'm blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him. Everybody say, that I may know him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. In other words, all that stuff I just said, I'm going to need that if I'm going to resurrect from the dead. Anybody that resurrects from the dead like Jesus did is going to need everything that I just said in these verses before. Paul's not doubting the fact he's going to resurrect with Jesus. He's just saying, if I am, I'm going to have to have all this stuff I just named to you. And guess what? You are too. All of that stuff that was just named. I know most many of us look at each other and what, say, what was it? <laughs> what was that? Well, wait a minute. You went by it too fast, Pastor. What, what, what was that that I'm going to need? Well... This is just a pure, good, old-fashioned exposition about living life by the grace of God. That's really all it boils down to. Paul is saying, you, your joy is going to have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to, be, to just fly out of your life. Yeah, yeah. There are going to be people that do things, and it's, gonna, it, it's, it, it's just going to undermine you. It's going to sap your energy it's going, to, it's going to take away the joy of the Lord in your heart if you let it. And so what I'm writing to tell you is how you have to live in order to maintain joy in your life. You know, we talked in the first chapter about, you know, how to be joyful no matter what and how to get along with people and how to deal with difficult people. And, and, uh, and here he is in the third chapter again saying, hey, look, don't forget about that joy stuff now. Because it really is going to move your life forward. It's going to motivate you. It's going to be the strength of your life. The joy of the Lord is the strength of our life, guys. I don't know if you're aware of this, but while we're here on this earth, it's a tough time. We have tough sledding. It's, it's difficult to live this life. It's difficult to be true to God and be holy in our life and be, and, and be, and, and be graceful in our outlook and to be faithful in, in what we hope and, 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 and what we put our confidence in. And it's really, 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 really easy to make up a bunch of rules and start trying to live by those rules as if living by those rules is going to take care of our spiritual life. Churches are filled with people who came to them as new Christians excited and just, man, just excited about Jesus in their life and full of enthusiasm and full of joy. And then they sat in the congregation and they went in the classes and they met the mature Christians yes, yeah, yeah. who told them, all right, you, salvation is free, but man, when you come to church, we got some rules you got to obey. And then they, got, then they got a long list of the rules, and the rules just robbed the joy right out of their heart, right out of their life. Paul says, that's the kind of stuff you're going to face in this world we live in. When even the righteous, even the ones that are trying to help do things that rob your joy and kill your joy. So he says, I have three things. Well, I say three. He, he just talked about them, but I say three things. <laughs> preachers always have you noticed preachers always have three things always three it's divine isn't it it's the trinity right father son holy spirit got one point for each of them body soul and spirit yeah you're 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 a threefold nature you know rose in three days i'm telling you three uh, three is a divine word but but anyway i have three suggestions for you okay we're gonna, we're gonna look at paul we got three suggestions about how to maintain your joy 
Because unless you are a super saint and uh, you have a, some kind of a, a, a stash somewhere that we don't know about of the joy of the Lord, because we know about it, we're coming after it, I'm telling you that right now. But, but, but unless you have that, uh, I'm going to tell you something. There is going to come a time where your joy is going to be stolen. And, it's gonna, and, and it might not even be very dramatic. It might be just that you just all of a sudden wake up one day and go, I'm not excited about Christ anymore. What happened? Yeah. What happened? I don't know if I want to go to church. I mean, you know, all these attitudes and different things you know, that we all face. Have any of you ever faced any of those attitudes? Come on. Am I preaching to the right ones? Okay. All right. Well, let's just go at it then. All right. Here's number one, suggestion number one. In order to maintain your joy, you are going to have to resist legalistic attitudes. Legalism will rob your joy right out of your heart. As a matter of fact, in your notes, I put a, a definition of legalism. And I said legalism can be defined as substituting rules and regulations for a relationship with Christ. So when you substitute rules and regulations for a relationship with Christ, what happens is you take your focus off of what Christ has done for you and you put it on what you need to do for Christ. Mm -hmm. And anytime you start looking at what you can do to maintain your relationship with Christ by obeying these things is going to rob the joy right out of your life. Now, just so you will know that this is not just a current thing. This is not just something that happens in 21st century church. Uh, this is something that's happened for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, ever since there's been, been a real relationship with God on this earth, there have been people who have developed and coordinated rules by which all of us must go by yeah. in order to maintain the fact that we know the Lord. And don't break any of these rules because if you do, then you know, you're going to be out. You're going to be ostracized. You can't come to church here anymore. We're not going to have anything to do with you. You need to find somewhere else to go. And it's all kinds of little stuff like that. And, and I want you to see what Paul did. I mean, this is Paul. Uh, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, verse 2, beware of dogs. That's not a nice thing to say. I mean, you, I think Paul's a little ticked off. What do you think? I think he, I mean, all of a sudden he says, hey, I want you to be, I want you to be filled with joy and I'm not tired of writing that, man. Just be filled with joy. Don't forget about your joy in the Lord. And then he said, beware of dogs. I mean, he just burst out of nowhere with beware of dogs. Beware. Uh, oh, and by the way, these dogs, uh, these dogs, he's talking to, uh, about some people in his day. And just so you'll know, are you, inter are you interested in the history of, history of this? All right, let me just tell you. All right, he's talking to a group of people called the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. The Judaizers were the people in the day of Philippians and in the day really right after Jesus when Christianity became, uh, started coming in and people started coming to Jesus Christ and receiving him as their Savior. Most of those people, the first converts, most of them were Jewish people. Uh, they had been Jewish people all their life. They had followed the rules and the ceremonies and the rituals and all of that stuff of Judaism all of their life. And then all of a sudden, they became convinced that Jesus Christ was the Lord and they needed to receive Christ as their Savior. And they did it just like you and I do it. And so they became Christians. Well, as time went on, the churches began to form and they began to form with people who had been Jewish people because that, that's the religion they were before they came to Christ. And so what happened was they started bringing Judaism into Christ's church because that's what they knew. That's their life. That's what they, they lived. And so they felt like, hey, to be a good Christian, we need to be just like we were when we were Jews and we had these laws and we had these covenants and we had these rituals, we had these ceremonies, we had all this stuff. And so, and so we're going to have Jesus in our heart, but we're also going to have some of these rituals and customs and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and so what began to happen over a period of time is churches became dominated by Judaizers. 
and as, as it would be because they were the dominant religion and blah, blah. And, and, and it was a question about whether Gentiles, and it, it looks at your neighbor and say, of which you are. It was even a question in the early church whether Gentiles could even come to the Lord. That was a big argument, a big fight, a big council. They had a big meeting about whether Gentiles could even be preached to and try to win them to the Lord. Well, thank the, thank the Lord, people like James of the book of James and people like that were at this meeting and decided, hey, Christ is for the Gentiles just like he is for the Jews. Well, what happened was when Gentiles began to get saved and come into the church, now you got a group of people already there in the church. This is, this is their church, their church. And, and we, you know, we get these new, these new people coming in here. These new people, they're not like us. They didn't grow up like us. They, don't, they, don't, they never went to church. They don't have any Jewish customs, any Jewish rituals. They don't have anything like that. They don't know anything about all that kind of stuff. So what we need to do is we need to start having classes, and we need to teach them about all these customs and rituals. And then our biggest question, you know what the biggest question the Judaizers had? Whether somebody needed to become a Jew before they got saved, or whether they need to become a Jew after they got saved. That was their big question. Wasn't any question about, do you need Judaism anymore, which is the answer is no. Christianity supersedes it. It's not Judaism light or something. I mean, it replaces all of that. It was not intended to go with it and drag it along with it. It was intended once you come to Christ, you leave everything. You leave all that stuff behind you and you come to Jesus Christ and he is your only commitment for life. But the Judaizers said, well, now they, if they're going to be like us, they either got to become a Jew before they get saved or after they get saved because it's say here in this church right here, but you got to be, you got to, you got to follow these laws, these rules. Look at here. Look at all these ceremonies we got and all these structures we got in our church. And, and if you can't follow that brother, you'll just have to move on down the road and find another church somewhere. And Paul looks at and said, you bunch of dogs. Paul's looking at him and saying, anybody that tells you in order to come to Christ, you have to follow a bunch of rules and you have to live your life according to a bunch of regulations, what they are is a dog. And I'm going to tell you something. Today, we don't take that exactly like they took it. Now, it is, if I called you a dog uh, or some other slang of that, uh, would, would that offend you? Oh, man, it, it would be bad. But it was the worst thing you could say about someone in Paul's day because the, the dogs in Paul's day were not these cuddly little house pets that we have. No, they just put the little hat on and a little birthday thing and all that. No, no, you're thinking about your pet. I said, you're thinking, well, I'm a dog, not too bad. I mean, yeah, you think about your pet. What the dogs were in Paul's day were roving scavengers. They were like the wild dogs that you see on National Geographic Channel. And so where, I mean, these, these dogs roved around in packs and they would attack you and kill you. I mean, I mean, they were dangerous. They were fearsome, dangerous creatures that ran around the streets. My goodness, man. And Paul says, you know what people are that try to pour that stuff on you after you become saved? They are dogs. And he also says, and they are evil workers as opposed to uh, uh, Epaphroditus, my fellow worker, you know, someone who would help me, someone who would minister to me, somebody that believed like me and helped me do my stuff. No, these are not fellow workers. These are evil workers. In other words, they do evil stuff. They work at evil things. And then he calls them the mutilation. Now, this is really interesting. Y'all interested in this? All right, all right. This is really interesting because uh, in order to be a Jew and be in favor with God, you had to be circumcised. All of you know what circumcision is? Oh, yeah. So I don't have to demonstrate any of that. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. So the, the, one of the signs of the covenant with God for Jews is that they are circumcised on the eighth day. A baby's taken into the temple. The priest even does it. It's not even done by a doctor. The priest does it right there in the altar. Right there in the altar, yeah. I mean, like, like Lawrence said back then, it was with a rock. Oh, imagine that. But anyway, but anyway, so in order to be right with God, every Jewish person had to 
perform a ritual. The ritual was you had to be circumcised. Well, now with Christ, nobody has to be circumcised with Christ. That's not a ritual that we follow. That's not something Jesus said we needed to do as a sign that we belong to him. So it's no longer necessary as a religious act to be circumcised. And so when these Judaizers were coming to these Gentiles who were not circumcised because they did not grow up in Judaism and they were not circumcised on the eighth day and they're grown people and they come in and these Judaizers are saying, hey, to come in here in this church, you're going to have to get circumcised, man. Because we all are and that's one of the things that God recognizes as people. That are. And so Paul said to them, I'm not even going to call you the circumcision because the circumcision is a complimentary name. The circumcision is what we call Jewish people. It's a, uh, it's a title of honor. We're the, you know, I mean, it's the sign of God. I mean, we're, we're the circumcision. We're not going to call you the circumcision. We're going to call you the mutilation because that's all you do, and You're just cutting somebody up. It has no purpose, no meaning, no fulfillment whatsoever. So you're a bunch of mutilators of the flesh who require people to do things that aren't necessary to distort their body so, so that they can be right with God. Paul said, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. This is the age we live in. And I'm looking at Paul saying, hey, that's the age we, that's the age we live in. For we, are, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and we have no confidence in the flesh. So in, in, in other words, in order to uh, live a joyful Christian life, we are going to have to leave legalism. Now, I know it's not hard to leave legalism like I've just been talking about. If I told you you had to be circumcised to become a member of this church and you were not, would you? We could, we could, we could narrow our roles down real clear, you know, real quickly. Uh, on that. I mean, it's hard enough <laughs> like it is. Could you imagine if that was one of our rules? So, so everybody says, oh yeah, we can, we can forget that legalism stuff and all that kind of stuff. But, but hold on just a second. Cause I mean, legalism is, is legalism. It's like a root. It, 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 it's, uh, it's pervasive. It's not just big stuff like some big thing like Paul's been talking about. It's all kinds of stuff. And so uh, in order for us to kind of get the picture of what legalism might be, let's just look at what Paul says about himself. He says, how do I know, how do I know if I am beginning to trust in legalism? How do I know if legalism is slipping into my life somehow and it's going to kill my joy and I, and I want to head it off at the pass? I want to see it before it gets here. I want to know it's on its way. So how would I recognize it? Yeah, yeah. So Paul says, all right, let me use my own life as an example for you. And here's what he says, though I, might have, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he might have confidence in the flesh, man, look at my resume. All right, so the first thing he says is, I was circumcised on the eighth day. How do I know if legalism is slipping in my life? Well, the Apostle Paul says, when you begin to trust in rituals, you find your life, you begin to claim rituals. You begin to, you begin to trust in those things that, 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 uh, that have some form or figure. Give you an example. Give you an example. Well, I, I know I'm a Christian because I was baptized when I was a baby. Okay. Well, I know I'm a Christian because, I, you know what? I learned the catechism in the, in the first grade, and I can say that whole catechism, and I know that I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian because I go to church. I'm there every time the door's open, man. I'm here every Sunday. I, you can count on me. I was baptized in the river, man. I'm a Christian. You know I'm a Christian because, man, you don't get baptized. You get I baptized in the little baptistry at church. Ain't nothing but being baptized in the river. That's the real thing. You see what I'm doing? What I'm claiming is my relationship with Christ is real because of some ritual I followed. And if you didn't follow the same ritual as me, then you're not saved. So we all end up following a bunch of rituals, thinking somehow that's going to bring our joy of the Lord back. And it's Jesus that does that. So Paul says, hey, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Now look at this. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
This is uh, heritage. This is race. Uh, this is family lineage stuff right here. Hey, granddaddy, my papa was a preacher. Come on, man. I know the Lord. My whole family went to church. I went to church from the time I had diapers on. Man, my family took me to church. Listen, you can get religion through a relationship, but you can't get Jesus through a relationship. You have to have him personally in your own heart. Jesus has no grandchildren, okay? Okay. <laughs> You don't get Jesus by osmosis by being in the same house with people that love the Lord and know the Lord. It's a personal relationship with you. And when, and when you start claiming things like, well, you know, uh, man, Pastor Keith's one of my best friends. You know, I, I love him, and I go to church, and, 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 and my family's always been in church, and, and we're there, and we help do things in church. And, and you start using that to claim, that's my, that's my reason for believing that I'm, I've got a relationship with Christ? Mm -mm. Legalism's getting you. It's, it's slipping in. And then he said, oh, and, and of the tribe of Benjamin, just want to remind you, Benjamin was the purest tribe of Israel. Uh, it was Benjamin that their first king, Saul, came out of. He was a Benjamite. So, I mean, he's claiming high order here. And then he says, uh, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is religion. To be a Hebrew, Paul's bringing up the fact that he grew up knowing everything Judaism taught and he did everything that Judaism said a person must do. He was a Hebrew. He was a chosen one. He was a covenant one. He did the temple. He did the sacrifices. He did the the commands. He did everything. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's saying, I am, man, I followed my religion. I'm telling you. Now, may I tell you this? Jesus Christ has absolutely nothing to do with religion. The only, the only thing Jesus had to do with religion is he opposed it 100%. Religion is your attempt to get yourself to God on your own. Christianity is God bringing you to himself because you're not good enough and you can't do it. But you hear people whenever they begin to claim, uh, well, I'm a Baptist. Uh, uh, I, you know, I go down to a Methodist church down there. I'm a Catholic, man. I, uh, you know, uh, do you know the Lord? Well, uh, I, you know, I belong to that church over there on Three Rivers. or uh, my, my pastor down Dito. And uh, I mean, claiming religion. You might be a Baptist. You might be a Methodist. And, and look, there's nothing wrong with being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pente Pentecostal or a Catholic or whatever. The point is, do you know Jesus? That, that's the point about the whole thing. No matter what brand you may claim, do you know the Lord? But see, legalism will slip in, and it happens so subtly. Man, we don't do that in our church. We don't, we don't, we don't act like that. We don't say that. We don't do that. We don't, we, that doesn't happen in our church. Religion, man. Do you know, I grew up in a church and I'm not even, I'm, I mean, everybody knows me, knows where I went, and I'm not really trying to say something against him personally. I'm just showing you the age and stuff that I lived in. I mean, there were a lot of churches like this. But I, we, were, I was, we had a little youth choir, and this little youth choir went everywhere singing for other churches and, you know, doing a little skits and plays, and Tanya and I were in that, and, and our youth went from church to church. Do you know that we had some other churches in our area that did that? And our church would not even let that, those churches come into our church. You know why? Because they played their music on a little cassette tape. Absolutely. And that music had a little bit of guitar on it and a little bit of drums on it and a little bit. It ain't got nothing but a piano, baby. And I'm wondering, do you realize that a piano is a percussion instrument, that it bangs like a drum and it has strings like a guitar? And I mean, you're just playing it upright, sitting down instead of plucking it? Come on. But no, no, no. We got to be holy, holy. You can't let that devil music in and blah, blah. I'm talking religion. You don't think that robs the joy out of the young people? You don't think that stole our enthusiasm? 
You mean we're doing something wrong? We thought we were honoring Jesus. We thought we were singing about You mean we were doing something wrong? Oh, God. Oh, forgive me, God. I mean, joy flies out the window. No joy of the Lord. Only condemnation. You know what causes that? Religion causes that. That's what Paul's saying. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, buddy. You can't get more religious than I am. I can guarantee you that. And then he says, in, 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 the, in the big, concerning the law, I, I'm a Pharisee. I follow all the, the rules and all the regulations, so I'm a pro at rules and regulations. You know, that's what Pharisees were. Pharisees were experts at rules and regulations. Yeah, let me tell you this, and you might not even know this. The Jewish religion established... And if you don't believe it, now don't do it now. But when you get in your car or going home, whatever, ask Siri about it, and um, and and say six hundred, say six hundred and thirteen commandments. Just type that in, and you'll go to a bunch of websites that have all of them on there. The Jewish religion established six hundred and thirteen laws to to confirm the Ten Commandments. In other words, the 10 that God wrote came down to them and then their Pharisees and their scribes and their teachers of the law and their experts on religion said these 10 are not clear enough. So they established 613 more rules that the Jews had to follow besides the 10 commandments. Like... You couldn't pick your child up. Well, you could pick your child up on, on the Sabbath day as long as he didn't have a rock in his pocket. If he had a rock in his pocket, you were working on the Sabbath day by carrying a load, and you couldn't do it. You couldn't look in the mirror on the Sabbath day. You know why? I could, but you couldn't, because you might see a hair in there that's turned gray, and you might pluck it, and that's work on the Sabbath day. Hey, yeah, I'm talking about how ridiculous is this? I mean, this is how foolish people can become when rules and regulations become the way you live life and, and the way you practice your, 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 your uh, relationship with God. Man, that's why joy just flies. You couldn't walk more than one mile per day. I mean, you couldn't walk more than one mile on the Sabbath day in any direction. One mile, I don't know, one mile, I guess, was considered holy, and, and anything more than one mile was, you know, was out there. And you guys, you guys that have tattoos will love this one. You couldn't have a tattoo on your skin. No, man, that's inviting heathens and pagans into your body. That's defiling your body, which God created. God created your body, and when you put marks on it that are permanent, you defile it, and you can't have that, and that's one of our laws, baby. Don't come down here with one. You won't go in the synagogue with that. Yeah. See, you, do you, but do you see what I'm talking about? I'm saying that if we're going to maintain joy, we have got to fight this attitude of legalism because it creeps into all of our lives if we're not careful. We have a relationship with Jesus. We are a certain way because we believe he wants us to be this way, not because if we act this way, it makes us more saved or less saved. We don't, we're, not, we're not acting a certain way in order to get saved. We're acting this way because we are saved. Because Jesus lives in the inside of our life. It's a matter not of imitation, trying to follow somebody that's following a bunch of rules and regulations and laws. It's not imitation, it's habitation. It's the Holy Spirit inhabiting our heart and our life that gives us a relationship with God. So the Apostle Paul says, all right, all right. Uh, you got you to resist that, that legalism stuff because it, it's going to kill you. And then he says the last thing, uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning, I mean, I'm really excited. I'm really uh, full of energy about killing Christians. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. Hey, that, I got a great reputation. My reputation's great. You know what? I go to church every Sunday. I sit on the front row. I sing in the choir. Um, teach class. Um, man, I do everything. I, you, you can't lay one charge against me, buddy. I do everything I'm supposed to do, and I do it right. And that's legalism. Would you like to see another one? 
That's not the only thing that will steal your joy, by the way. Here's the other one. Keep your priorities in perspective. Keep your priorities in perspective. That means, that means do the right things for the right reasons. That means stuff like don't get bent out of shape over stuff that doesn't matter. How about that? Yeah, we blow up on stuff. I, I'm telling you, we lose our joy over things that don't matter one iota. Like your wife dents the fender of the car, okay? She comes in, she says, hey, honey, I'm sorry I dented the fender. If you want to see it, it's in the trunk. Uh, you know, you got you to just... You just gotta, you just gotta say, babe, that's all right. We, that's why we got some insurance up, up in the house. We ain't getting all upset over that. I mean, in a few weeks, uh, I'm gonna probably preach too long, and the saints are already gonna be kicked off by the time you get home, and you don't need to get all bent out of shape and mad about, about that. I mean, they do make uh, digital video recorders. I, I suggest you get one. Uh, it'll save your life. By the way, it'll save. I'm gonna tell you. Uh, if I had a second, which I'll just take a second. Y'all got a second? I'm going to take a second because I'm, I'm in the neighborhood. I'm in the neighborhood. I'm, it just made me think when I said get this DVR, this digital video recorder, it'll save your marriage, guys. Seriously. I mean, it'll save your life. Because let me ask you this. When is the time most convenient for your wife to demand some project be done uh, it's probably not time sensitive. It's probably like, hey, this garbage needs to be taken out today, today. But we got to have it like done like now, right now. Well, babe, the kickoff is just about, you know, I don't know what it is about ESPN that, that just, that kills women. But I'm going to tell you, whenever they hear that, that da 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 that's just like an alarm goes off in their brain that says, I've got to get something done now. I mean, it's right. Well, if you don't, if you don't have a DVR, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to sit there and you're going to keep on watching this. You're going to come back in there and say, I, I, thought, we, I thought you were going to take the trash out. I am, but I'm going to take the trash. I mean, it's in there stinking and, the, and it needs to be taken out. Okay, I'll get it again. Get, and, then, and then you'll do everything you can to forget about it. And you're looking at your first and 10 on the phone, you know. And then about, about five minutes later, come back. Hey, this is the last time I'm telling you. I need that garbage. That's stinking out there. There's like little gnats flying around that garbage can in there, and then we got to get that garbage, and then you have to leave the game and go get it. Now, that same deal with your DVR, same deal. Uh, honey, I, I need that garbage out. It's stinking in there. Click, stop, pause. <laughs> All right, babe, I got it. I'm right on it right now. Go get it. Come back in there. Boop, right back where you left it. You hadn't missed a thing. She's happy. You happy. The garbage is happy. Everybody's happy. <laughs> so anyway, see, so what I'm talking about is getting your life in perspective. <laughs> what I'm talking about is are, are your priorities. And, and let me just, let me, let me read the verse because I've just fallen off the track here. All right. Here's what Paul says. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I might, that I might gain the Lord. All right. Here's what this is dealing with. I, I'm going to put it in a nutshell for you real quick. Paul says life is filled with trade-offs. Trade-offs. In other words, I give up something, in order to gain something, right? Now, is there anybody who hasn't lived life this way? I give up some stuff in order to gain some other stuff, right? Now, what that is, is priority. If you say, what are priorities? Well, priorities are what you gain, what you give up something in order to gain. It's what's important in your life. It's what comes out number one, not number 12 down here. It's what are the most important things in life. And the Apostle Paul says that life is filled with these profit and loss statements, really, where 
I've gained this much and I've lost this much. And so am I doing good? If you look at your budget that way, if you look at your household income that way, you're, you're looking at, all right, what have I done with my money? And is what I've done with my money worth what little bit of money I got left or having to live on a budget or take my sandwich to work or whatever, you know? I mean, is it worth it? It's a profit and loss. You see where your money went and how much you lost and how much you have left and what you did with it. And all. I mean, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing with his life in these two verses right here. And so what he's really saying to us is he's saying, look, uh, in coming to Christ, and I've had people actually say this to me, in coming to Christ, it was like, Pastor, you know, I've been thinking about coming to Christ and I really would like to be a Christian, but, but, but what am I going to have to give up? Now, let me just tell you up front. You are going to have to give up something in order to come to Christ. And you say, what? And I'm going to say, everything. You're going to have to give it all up. Boop. Does that change your mind? <laughs> you got to give it all up. But let me ask you a question. Who wouldn't give up dirt for diamonds? Huh? Who wouldn't give up uh, garbage for gold? I mean, come on. You know, I mean, who wouldn't give up uh, uh, disaster for peace? You know? I mean, who wouldn't give these things up? I'm just saying that I'm not much of an accountant. But in looking at the profit and loss of my life with Jesus, I think my gains have been a lot more than my give-ups. I think I've received a lot. Who wouldn't give up hell for heaven? I mean, come on. It's not giving up much. We're coming out on the good end of this stick. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. Look, here's, what he, here's how he says it. But what things were gained to me, all right, these I have counted for loss. Okay, what I thought, all that stuff I bragged on just a minute ago, I thought that was something I should be proud of, and it was a gain. It was in the plus column. But what I found out now is all that stuff I just talked about, it doesn't go in the plus column. It goes in the minus column. And I've given it up, yet indeed I also count all things loss. Why, Paul? Why did you give up all things? Why did you trade off all this stuff? You traded off. You gave that up to do what? For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Paul said, I gave all that stuff away, and what I got was an excellence in Jesus Christ. And then he said, uh, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as garbage. Well, you threw away all your stuff and it's counted as garbage. Why did you do it? That I might gain Christ. You see, he's saying, I got rid of stuff in order that I could get stuff in life. And I'm just telling you, in order for us to maintain our joy, we have to, we have to keep a perspective of the priorities of our life. And sometimes we're going to have to give up stuff in order to gain stuff. Okay? You got to give up your time watching TV on Sunday afternoon to come to class so you can learn how to control the mind that God gave you. You see, you see what I'm talking about? Hello? I mean, is that boiling it down good enough right there? I got to miss a kickoff because I'm going to church every Sunday because I love the Lord and I want to hear what the Lord has to say to me. So I give up that. Get you a DVR. I give up that. In order to gain this. <laughs> All right, let me give you the third one. And I, I know y'all are worn out and tired, but hang with me just one second. Get to know Christ better and better. The more you get to know Christ, the, be the more joy you're going to have in your life. Because knowing Jesus better and better brings joy into your life. And... And so when, when it comes to what Paul had to say, uh, that I might know him, that's the, that's the essence, that I might really know him. And, and look, I'm not talking about knowing about him. A lot of us know a lot about Jesus, right? And we, we, we really think we know a lot more than we probably really do know. But we do know a lot about Jesus. So I'm not saying you need to take a seminar and you need to learn some more stuff about Jesus. I'm saying you need to grow toward Jesus. In other words, become intimate with Jesus. Not just 
not knowing him right here, but knowing him like right here, I've heard it said before that some people are going to miss heaven by about 12 inches, you know, about the distance from right here to right, right here. You know, you're going to miss heaven by a foot because you got him up here. You just don't have him right here. And what I'm saying is the more you have him right here, the more joy you're going to have in life. And how do you get him right here? I mean, just boiling it down to just quick brass tacks. How do you get him right here? Well, one thing, you spend time with him. How, listen, how much, Tanya and I have been married 40 years. We know everything, everything about each other. What would I know about her if the only time I spent with her was in a crowd this size right here? I wouldn't know much, would I? Because you can't get... You can't get personal in a crowd. And so to get personal with Jesus, you've got to get with him. You've got to spend some time with Jesus. One-on-one, -on -one, personal time. And then, here's another little just suggestion. Talk to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talk to him. Say, Jesus, I love you. Hey, what do you want me to do in my life? I'm here. I open. Give me wisdom. Direct my path. Lord, I got a big decision coming up. What do I need to do? And then once you talk to him, then listen for what he says to you. You know, so many people pray. They talk to Jesus and then they walk away like they didn't, like they never said anything. Uh, you know, and then the Lord begins to try to answer them and, and, they're, and they're oblivious to it because they don't even remember what they prayed about. You know why? Because they think talking to Jesus is talking to the thin air. They think talking to Jesus is like talking to Santa Claus or something. Jesus is a real person, guys. He is a person, the person of Jesus Christ. He is a live, living entity, and you can talk to him. Now, when he talks back to you, he might use the Word of God. You might be reading your Bible. Ooh, imagine that. What, a, what, a, what an attitude that might be. I actually read it for, for with no reason except just to see what it says. And then all of a sudden, some verse comes across there, and you say, Good night. What is that? That's God's answer. He just said it to you. There it is right there. Or it'll come in a message. Or it'll come in your heart. Or it'll be spoken by another Christian. Man, God God will speak to your heart. So I got to spend time with him. And then I got to talk to him. And then, and then one other thing. I got to trust him. In other words, everything in life is not going to be good. Everything that happens to you is not going to be good. Even though you're a Christian, everything that happens in your life is not going to be you know, uh, Candy Cane Lane and Marshmallow Boulevard. You're going to have some stuff in life. You know why you have stuff in life? Because God needs you to trust him. And how is he going to, how, how is he going to train you to trust him? Well, he's going to arrange some circumstances whereby it gets a little tight or hard or inconvenient or uncomfortable and you have to adjust yourself to him because he's going to take care of it, but you're gonna, it's not going to be on your time schedule, and it's not going to be the way you thought, and it's not going to fly like you thought it would. And, and, and he teaches you to trust him this way. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the first thing that happens, you can't fly off. You can't just run away and say, it's God's stuff, ain't nothing to this. You know, I mean, God, these things happen. They, look, it takes a long time to develop this kind of relationship. You're not going to have it by walking in on Sunday morning and leave going, oh, man, it's so wonderful to have this deep relationship with Christ. No, it's going to take some time, a lifetime, actually. But it's worth it because... The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. And it is. And it's amazing how different, how differently, right, things look. How differently, Tanya's my English expert, how differently things look when the joy of the Lord's filled your life. All right, Sandy. <laughs>